Um, this format worked last year quite well, and so I think it's a good format for uh, luncheons like this, a conversation where it's a little more free-flowing and we can get into a few more things that, um, that might not come up if someone just came with a speech. Um, if David was giving a speech, he might start by telling you that um, his first reporting was as a boy in Syracuse, New York. He broadcast out of a cardboard box in his family's living room. I have to ask him something about that uh, down the road, but I will tell you, in case you haven't noticed, uh, he's made some progress since then. The cardboard box was re replaced by uh, uh, a smaller box that he'd like to see on uh, ABC in as many homes in America as possible. Uh, David went from, uh, from there uh, to become one of the preeminent journalists in America. He's covered news in hot spots all over the world and interviewed major public figures from Hillary Clinton to Apple CEO Tim Cook to Pope Francis. And as they say in the news business, let's roll the videotape. Every day, a journey, historic, from the Vatican with Pope Francis. Do you have a message for America? Groundbreaking, from the Serbian border, Cuba, the White House, all across America. Right here in California, Iowa, Baltimore, Washington tonight. Newsmaking. Did you make a mistake? And when American jobs are on the line. Vamos a ver la marca de los Estados Unidos en, en una coche. He leads the charge. Made in America! Connecting us to each other because he reports to you. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir. And that was nice and short and sweet, David. Thank you very <laughs> yeah, much. I produced uh, that myself about an hour ago. David, <laughs> David may be an anchor man, but he is uh, not afraid to roll up his sleeves, get his hands dirty, slogging through the mud in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, or battling the crowds in Tahrir Square to cover the Arab Spring in Cairo, or fending off attackers in Somalia covering the famine there. Um, that has won him a number of Emmys and a very prestigious Edward R. Murrow Award for investigative reporting. David is a graduate of Ithaca College. He now occupies the anchor chair at AB, ABC News, which we see here at 5.30. And in point of fact, David will be anchoring this evening's broadcast right here in the city of Chicago. But um, unlike certain people who've come through here and broadcast from Chicago, he will not be sitting in a studio. David plans to be out at North Avenue Beach, uh, anchoring that newscast uh, outside. He got lucky, it's a warm day. But let me, but let me just ask you, um, why outside when there are some nice studios? I mean, the studios are really nice here in Chicago. But you know, typically, and we've done this from the start, it's been about a year now anchoring the evening news, uh, an honor and a privilege. But when we go on the road, we like to show where we are. And so whether that means traveling the world or, or here to Chicago for this, um, and, and we never travel anywhere to do a, a luncheon without getting a story, too. So we landed on the first flight into Chicago this morning and headed straight to a public uh, high school. And um, we have a piece that, that will air tonight from, an, uh, from a surprise that we did uh, here in Chicago. But yes, we're going to stand outside. And I thought, you know, Chicago in October, that's, that's, a, you get lucky that's a gamble. You get lucky at 70. Uh, what's with the cardboard box in the living room? <laughs> exactly. Well, I, you know, hopefully it's a flat screen now. Um, the cardboard box was, you know, I, I wanted to be a reporter since I was 12 years old. And I wrote to the local news guy in my town at the time and asked him point blank, what do I need to do to prepare for your job uh, or a job? Yeah. I, I think that he, you know, I, I don't know. You were, perhaps poaching, he, you were poaching jobs at age 12? <laughs> age 12. Well, I, he probably, I don't know if he regrets writing back, but he did invite me in. And so I went to visit the station at, at, at 13 years old and, and began interning. And I would carry the tripods um, and the equipment at the time to all the stories. And I remember ripping the scripts for the anchors and getting their Cokes out of the Coke machine. Uh, and they had a, a growth chart on the newsroom wall and would measure how much I'd grown from summer to summer. <laughs> this was hazing in its purest and earliest form. And, and they would also joke that each summer my voice would drop a half an octave, which I'm lucky it did, otherwise I'd still be in the cardboard box in the living room. But um, so in looking back, I have a lot of people to thank along the way. And it's been an interesting year. You know, I spent a few years in the news business myself, and, and I've watched a, a very, very uh, significant change in, in the World News Tonight broadcast in the last, uh, in the last year since you've been uh, an anchor and managing editor uh, together, which gives you some say over the broadcast. Um, I think you're 
you probably get twice as many stories onto a broadcast. Some are shorter, some when they need to be are longer. But it's a very different newscast. It moves a lot more quickly, um, and it moves around to an awful lot of venues. And I say kiddingly, I don't think there is an interesting picture that moves anywhere on the planet that doesn't get on World News Tonight. What, what motivated you to, to think about reformatting in some sig significant ways? Is David, I think my, one mic's off. Oh. Uh, there we go. Okay, back on. Okay, so I'll tell you what, I'll give you mine. Oh, here comes. Oh, oh. wireless. Okay. The city that brought you Oprah. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm encouraged that you've noticed, and I think that we've just sort of built on the foundation, honestly, of the, of the folks who, who came before me and the team that was putting together that broadcast. But I think that when you report, and I had been there, uh, I was hired when Peter Jennings was still the anchor and had uh, the privilege of reporting for him uh, early on. And so for about a decade, they would sort of send me to the hotspots around the world, Fukushima, uh, Tahrir Square during the Arab Spring, uh, Mogadishu for the, for the famine, Katrina before Katrina even arrived. I was sleeping in the Superdome with everybody. And I think that when you come from that and you are, are told that you're going to get this opportunity to be an anchor, you know, my goal was from the very start not to be attached to that desk. And so that is why we try to get out and, and we've been reporting from all over the world. We've taken the broadcast to Cuba. A couple of weeks ago we were on the Hungarian border uh, with Serbia. Um, we were the first broadcast to go there. We got the exclusive with the president on Cuba, and, and it's world news tonight. And I've heard um, people say, you know, where we want more world news. Uh, and that's not to say we don't care uh, hugely about what's happening in government here in America and in politics. And uh, one of the series that, that I love and I've been doing for four years now is Made in America, where we go from uh, town to town to champion small town victories, keeping jobs here, creating jobs here. So the pace of the newscast, it's, you know, it gets a lot of attention. And I, I don't always know why, because there was never a discussion to make the newscast faster or younger, because you happen to be, you know, the younger anchor on TV right now. I just thought when we started, you know, the old school way of doing it might be a 15 second intro, two minute piece. 15 second intro, two minute piece. And I thought, you know, there are some stories that deserve longer than that. And there are some stories that, listen, I can just turn to Martha Raddatz, who's traveled the world for us, and ask her, Martha, what's the bottom line on this? And she can just cut, cut through it all and tell us what we need to know. And that might not take two minutes. And so I just have tried to vary the pace so that we can get more uh, content in the broadcast. And I think that, um, it's working out pretty well so far. It is working out well. You have a half a million more viewers per day than when you started, and you do go neck and neck on some measurement barometers with NBC, which had ruled the evening news roost for a very long time. Do you think that's format driven, or do you think it's, I mean, what would you attribute that to? Um, are you recapturing the millennials and, and others who, who Conventional wisdom suggests don't pay attention to TV news anymore? Well, I mean, thank you for, for, for pointing that out. I, ha I had no idea we were neck and neck. <laughs> it's, it's On some little, nights. It's become a little more competitive, which, which has upped really, quite frankly, everyone's game across the board. And I think that that only is... Uh, the advantage goes to the viewer at home. Um, but, you know, the first week on the air, we went to the Syrian border and did a story on uh, refugees, child refugees, who were in their third or fourth year. Instead of going to school, the truck picks them up in the morning and takes them out to the fields, and so we boarded the truck with them. And they worked six, seven hours in the fields and then would, would sort of hum uh, and sing songs as they skipped across the field going to these makeshift UNICEF schools. And we did that piece in the first week, and within 24 hours, there were enough donations uh, to build a, and supply, uh, supply 2,200 uh, of those makeshift UNICEF schools. So this notion that people don't care about the world around them, I just don't buy. And it, that started the first week. Um, it's hard to travel when you're tied to the desk five days a week, and so often we'll just take off on a weekend. We went to Mexico City and did, uncovered how in that city there are still disabled children who are locked in cages for really most of the day. And uh, the government authorities there took action after um, the group that we profiled looking into that. So I'm determined to travel the world and make sure um, that we're engaged and that we're willing to, to break from the mold of, of the evening news as it's been defined for years. And the interesting thing, let me just add one more thing, is that I grew up watching Peter Jennings and I, you know, I thought he was the master at having a conversation with America every night. 
Uh, I remember watching and guessing who the person of the week was going to be on Friday. He would often give us clues during the broadcast. But I think that we're in a moment now, uh, this sort of, you know, and it sounds cliche, but this modern era where people wake up in the morning and they're instantly connected. You check your smartphone, your iPhone, and you have the news in it already. Uh, and you're at work and you see the headlines cross. You get tweets during the day. And so I think people in this hyper-connected world, what I think we've noticed, and you mentioned a half million viewers coming back to the evening news, I think that is because people are being bombarded all day long with information. And more than ever, I think uh, there is a hunger for a clearinghouse and for people who are going to cut through it all and truly give you the bottom line without wasting your time. And that's sort of the balancing act that we do night to night, and I, and I think that um, I think so far, so good. And one more question about that, and we'll switch to some more substantive things. What do you think the upside potential is? I mean, a lot of people have pretty much written off millennials and Gen Zers and basically said they'll never come back to television. It'll always be inside their smartphones. And Nightly News or World News Tonight or the CBS Evening News, they're dinosaurs and they're going to go the way of the dinosaurs sooner or later because the audience will keep, keep shrinking. Now, you sit there trying to, to not resuscitate, but to try to grow uh, an audience in, in a legacy broadcasting situation, are you optimistic or do you think uh, um, you're fighting a battle? That, I mean, people ask me that about the BGA. You look at the mess all around you. I mean, are you optimistic? I'm optimistic every day, but there's an yeah. awful lot of trouble out there. I'm more than optimistic. And w when I see how fractured the media landscape is today, I actually welcome it. You know, you hear, um, you have polarized voices all over cable news, and I welcome them all. And, and people say, well, uh, is it hard to do what you believe is, you know, fair and balanced or objective reporting in an age when people can uh, get what they want to hear back to themselves? And I actually say the more people watch all the cables, all the broadcasts, you know, watch the competition, my competition as well, the more informed we can be. I get asked a lot about Donald Trump. And, you know, people were saying for weeks and weeks, you know, is this a reality show we're watching? And I think that America recognizes this, this is a reality. This is not the reality show, this is the presidential race. And, and I think one, one gift that Donald Trump has given is that he has started the conversation earlier than we ever would have been talking, at least uh, with this amount of time. Uh, and, and I think paying attention to the presidential race is a good thing. Now you can debate what you're hearing and, and whether or not you're hearing enough about the issues that you care about, but the fact that we're talking this early, I welcome. Yeah, and the, the two debates, or a couple of debates, had record viewership this early in the cycle. I mean, how do you handicap it at this point? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting. We were talking about this uh, while we were having lunch. I was asked, was I surprised by the numbers for the Republican debate? I was actually more surprised by the numbers for the Democratic debate. I mean, you have, uh, you know, Donald Trump showing up at the debate, and he says, you know, my numbers are huge. And, uh, you know, he, but he works in that he, arena before. He knows, he knows how to pull people in and to engage people. Um, it, what I was surprised by were the record numbers also at the first Democratic debate. But I think it comes at a point where, you know, obviously the two uh, front runners in that race, Hillary Clinton and then Bernie Sanders, and I, and I think that people knew that this um, was a make or break moment for her and, 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 and how she would perform during the debate. But they also wanted to know more, more about this guy who's giving her a run for her money in New Hampshire and in Iowa. So uh, handicapping I'll leave to the pundits, but, uh, but I am glad that people are tuning in and that they're engaged in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. You think Biden's going to run? Or you have no inside information on that? He hasn't called me today. <laughs> and yesterday he was sort of, you know. Okay. No. I would love to have the Joe Biden interview. We'll see, we'll see what he decides. I do think a lot of people have said that there was a moment, a window, when, when you could really hear the chorus of his supporters saying, jump in. Um, and I'm not sure if that dynamic changed in any way over the course of the last week, given the debate. Let me ask you, you saw the first half of our program today. We focused on civic disengagement and a push for civic engagement. Do you think the news business has any obligation to push civic engagement? I know ultimately your business, you need viewers, mm -hmm. and viewers translate into ratings and dollars, and that's essentially, I mean, you can do the best job you, you, you want to. I always try to, but ultimately it is a business. And so what, what commitment, if any, do you feel to try to remedy this malaise we have out here with so many people having checked out? Well, I, th I think we do have a responsibility. We have a responsibility first to hold people accountable. And so your group is to be applauded. I mean, we reported on what happened here with the school board last week. I had no idea that it began uh, with the investigative work of your team. Um, but I, I think that our job not only is to engage and to inform, but people will often ask with, with the Made in America series that I do. And we've come here to Chicago. We did a story within the last year on uh, WeatherTech uh, 
the mats in your car and the fact that this little company that could bought a Super Bowl ad and said, you know, we were told to take manufacturing overseas. And, you know, the series has never said buy only made in America or make things only here in America. But, but it was a question coming out of our very deep recession, which was if you buy one thing made in America over the next year, just one thing, if you check the label once, could you help create an American job? And we were always uh, struck by the group of economists that we had put together, uh, all things being equal, they said, yeah, if we all buy one thing, 65 bucks or so, we could create 200,000 jobs. So that was, that's, that was the conversation that started four years ago. Now today the viewers take that whole series, uh, they've taken it to a new level where they tell us where to go next. And I always think after the broadcast, when we do a story on a small, small town victory, they call the producer after the, the newscast, and this has happened more times than I can count, and they'll say our website crashed. And I always think that's the best thing ever. We just crashed another website. Um, but I do think that if you report, not only on Made in America, but when you standing on the Syrian border, and we were the first to go to Hungary on this incredible wave of refugees that we're witnessing right now, and if you report that with strong narratives and with people that, that we can all relate to, you know, I interviewed this young couple from Damascus, and um, she worked um, with, I, I, with an economist in Damascus, and uh, I believe he was a lawyer, and they were both carrying children, one on each waist. And they had made the journey, and we, were, we had crossed over the border. We were actually in Hungary, and it was pouring on us. And, and I, was, I, I said, what was it like that they'd made it to Hungary? And he stopped, and as the rain is coming down his face, he looked at me, and he said, I'm in Hungary? And he looked at his wife and they broke into this giant smile. And I think that when you relay stories like that, I said to the team back in New York that we also have to go find that girl in the fields from a year ago on the Syrian border who's out of school. Where is she? And sure enough, she was still living in the same refugee camp, still out of school, still working in the fields. And we showed her on the smartphone the story about her a year later. And to see her smile, but to see her face maturing, uh, to, to see her grow from year to year. And we saw it immediately. There was another wave of donations for people trying to uh, help them, a particular program get some of those schools from those camps into public schools in the area. So when you ask about responsibility, I think there's a fine line, but I don't think there's anything wrong with getting people to think, getting people engaged, uh, getting them outraged, getting them encouraged that they can make a difference. Um, and since we're talking about investigative work here in this room, and I know you've had Brian Ross come and speak to the group before, you know, he did a piece in the last week on ISIS, and all the video that we've seen, we've seen the row of cars, and few of us, I'm sure you'll, you'll scratch your heads after this, but, you know, I certainly hadn't thought about it, but why are all of those SUVs Toyota? And why are they all fairly new Toyotas? And there are rows and rows of them. And so he reported that U.S. counterterrorism authorities are looking into where uh, ISIS is getting uh, the vehicles. Now Toyota says obviously it's not selling to ISIS, but there are now questions it's being investigated about whether or not supporters are, are, are getting their hands on these vehicles. But that is a way to push this reporting forward and I'm sure people at home in their living rooms will not look at another piece of video with a stretch of cars the same way again. You think they just like uh, Jan's commercials? Yeah, I definitely, I think that was it. I, um, you mentioned investigative reporting. What is the commitment on world news? I know Brian for many, many years. We had him out for one of our investigative awards events. But um, it's kind of hard to keep your eye on government. A, a lot of the stuff we do might be described as wonky. In other words, it's, it's really nitty-gritty behavioral stuff about institutions Yeah, and but people. it's really, really important. And I think there's a huge commitment to investigative reporting. Whenever we do a piece, it's called your, we do a Your Money series tracking uh, U.S. taxpayer dollars. And we always get an immediate response from viewers who want more of that. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, there should be more of that. And so I, I think there's a huge commitment to keep... Is that, how is the World News Tonight going to evolve over the next year if you continue to have a major say in that? Well, I mean, I think Brian and his team have, you know, I think uh, you'd have to ask him, but I, I, I think he would tell you, he makes it very clear that um, he, he's having a good time. He's been pounding down doors, and we, we've had quite a few investigative pieces by Brian uh, on our air. And, and it's not just Brian, we have, a, we have an incredible group of reporters, um, but Brian helps to lead the charge, at least on the investigative front. I mean, do you, you think the news media can help rein in some of this aberrant government behavior that we keep reporting on and talking about? Of course they can. Of course they can. I think it's, it's giving people a voice. You know, and it's not just investigative reporting. It's, 
it's really all types of reporting. You know, I mentioned the Made in America thing, and you know, there are these small town victories everywhere you look. It's just that we don't hear from these people. And when a website crashes at 7.02 after the evening news or two minutes after you get off, um, wherever we're airing at which time, uh, that, that is a true victory. And you hear from them immediately, and they say, well, well you know, had we just had a voice, we would have had a little more of this, this taste of success even earlier. We were at a Chicago public high school today for a project here in Chicago uh, by a family. They want to remain anonymous, uh, and, and that might change at some point. But it's called the Ving Project. And what they're doing is they're empowering teenagers between 14 and 18 years old to send in a video about someone, an unsung hero in your school or in your life. You know, for me, in that cardboard box, it might have been the guy who wrote back to me, to this 12-year-old, 13-year-old. So we went this morning to this high school, and this uh, gentleman who teaches music after school, he, he's not even a full-time teacher at the school. He shows up after school, had no idea. Uh, he thought he was at school for a meeting, and he came into the room, and we were there with the cameras as he's presented with a $1,000 check from one of his students, the whole, the whole room of students. Uh, and it was a powerful thing. But we have to do more stories like that uh, about highlighting the people who are, who are really making our communities better uh, places to live. A couple more questions. I know you have a newscast to do. Yeah. Uh, President Obama, after the last uh, mass shooting, basically said we're getting numbed to that in this country. And the sense of outrage is dissipating as we see this happening every couple mm -hmm. weeks. And I'm just wondering if you think, uh, do we collectively, I mean, my old business, your current business, do we, have some, do we have a responsibility? We put so much emphasis on those stories, and uh, we, met, we name the shooter, and of course, he has that moment of celebrity. Usually, it's posthumously. Mm -hmm. But I mean, does that cause any consternation in terms of how to cover those stories and, and, and what to report on or not report on? Listen, I just think, of course, we have to report on it. But I do think that we have to be fair. Uh, and there are moments in each one of these shootings that I, that I remember and record, and I, I can't erase the images. You know, with, with Newtown, it was when the president came to the school, and it was a couple of days after the fact. And I was outside, we were on the air doing uh, live coverage of the event, and instead of the president walking into the front of the room and, and facing the room, or coming down the aisle of this auditorium, I'll never forget, he walked in, I could see the feet, I was standing outside, he walked in and then took a seat in the front row, and it was the back of his head. It's not, not something you typically see. But you could hear the gasps of grown men in the room. And I presume many of them were the fathers of the victims in, in Newtown. And, um, and, and you could hear, it, w it was such a powerful thing that the room was so silent, but yet you could hear people um, gasping for air because the president walked in the room, and it wasn't because it was this president versus another president, but it was because the president was there acknowledging their loss. And so what, what do you do? I think our job is just to report it fairly. I mean, we did an hour, Diane Sawyer and I did an hour called Young Guns over the last year, year and a half, uh, about accidents. Uh, that was part of the hour, but it was also very important to head right in, out into the middle of this country where you know, I interviewed a couple of families, and when one family, they tried to take away the stigma of the gun. You know, they raised their children where, where guns uh, are to be taken care of, they'll be locked up, there'll be safety locks, and, and, um, and, their, and guns should be respected, and, and, and that was their, their take. And I think that if you respect where people are coming from and you get a conversation started, perhaps, um, perhaps there'll be headway at some point that, that the audience will be comfortable with. But the debate over whether or not to name you know, a suspect um, or what we should do about gun control, I, I still feel pretty strongly that that is up to the audience to decide. But we can't, we can't be numb to these stories. We have to make sure that we stay on them, and, and we do. Last question, David. Uh, you're re redefining the role of an anchor on the evening news. Uh, from a lot of your predecessors, you, you tweet regularly. You take selfies with people when you're moving around. You take the subway to work as opposed to waiting for a limo. Um, what's, is it just that's who you are, or you think it's important to kind of create a different image than, than the old Uncle Walter uh, image of uh, 30 years ago? What well, I grew up with. It, it's interesting. You know, I take the subway to work because the subway gets there a lot faster. That's why I take the subway. I mean, I, I look down on my iPhone most of the time, and this is actually a true story. On my way home from work, you know, I'm, I'm usually cleaning out the inbox, and I look up, and this guy is next to me. He goes, are you? And I, and I said, yeah. He goes, well, what happened today? <laughs> so here, 
I think my day is done, and now I'm giving, doing the newscast all over again on the subway. I mean, I'm glad he ran into me, otherwise he would have been clueless that night, wherever, wherever he was going. But, you know, I do those things because, honestly, that's just what I, that's, I usually show up, um, I, I wore a suit today for all of you, but I generally show up in the newsroom with, with, you know, jeans and a sweatshirt on for half the day while I'm in an edit room. Um, I'm certainly more comfortable out in the field chasing these stories than at the anchor desk, although it is a privilege. Uh, one of the first things I asked when I got the job, because I was lucky enough to work to watch and then to work for Peter Jennings and then to learn from Charlie Gibson and become friends with Diane Sawyer. I mean, I think about the kid in the box that you described and the kid who wrote to the, the local news anchor and, and I know that I've worked really, really hard and I've witnessed some horrific things and some incredible successes. And I, I am reminded every day that it's a privilege to be sitting there. And one of the first things I asked when, when I got the job, uh, there's a long hallway, and we, I walked the same stairwell in the same hallway to the set that, that Jennings and Gibson and Sawyer walked down. And I'm reminded of that, but I wanted, I wanted the whole team to be reminded every day when we get to that newsroom about the people who came before us. So you turn the corner off the elevators and you come to World News tonight, uh, you see Peter Jennings and Charlie and Diane at some of the places where they took the broadcast, and some of those places I was lucky enough to be standing beside them. So I sit here before you today and I thank you for allowing me to come. And if you're in New York, and, and I mean this, you're welcome to come in and watch World News tonight. You can ride the subway with me. But, but quite frankly, come in, take a walk down that hallway and just know that you know, I'm honored to be there. It's been an incredible first year. Uh, and, and, and you have fueled me today with your opening talk and that video to keep asking the tough questions. And, and you've reminded me to go back to the newsroom and tell them all uh, what you expect of us. So if thank they, you. If they come visit you, will you take a selfie with them? <laughs> if you want. I'm so trained on the stupid selfie technique. But if you want a selfie, we'll take David, a selfie. David, thanks so thanks. much. <laughs> so. The final word is a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you for any of, the, any of you who are helping us make the match. If you want to give it one more shot on your way out, please do. One final word. In the spirit of civic engagement, we have a table outside set up by the League of Women Voters. You can register to vote on the way out today if you're not registered and you'd like to. Otherwise, bettergov.org. Pay attention. We're fighting for you. We'll see you next year. Thanks, David.